Okay, I thought we might start now. I want to welcome you to another episode, shall we say, of Preservation in Place. My name is Donna Reiner. I am on the board of the Arizona Preservation Foundation. And we started this program during COVID when we had to cancel our uh, conference. And since then, we have offered a number of webinars. And this just happens to be another one. We're always looking for ideas. And this idea kind of came out of some things that my um, cohort uh, on the committee, Margaret Hangen, had uh, come up with and said, I know some people that can do this and this and this. Mm -hmm. So just a few um, mm -hmm. housekeeping rules. We will have a Q&A at the end. If you have questions, please post them in the chat and then we will uh, communicate those to our speaker. You should all be muted and no picture. And other than that, uh, when this, this meeting is being recorded and we will post the link to that as soon as we have it. And we will be sending that link to you so that you can share it. Uh, it is some of our past, well, all of our past ones that were recorded are on the Arizona Preservation YouTube link. So to get started, I want to introduce Margaret Hangen, who happens to be um, the other committee member that plans some of these fabulous events, and she will introduce our speaker today. And welcome all of you once again. And for those who don't, don't know me, I, uh, yes, my name is Margaret Hangen, and I'm uh, an archaeologist with the Tonto National Forest, currently uh, a co-worker with Leighton Curls, um, detailed into in our in enterprise program in the Forest Service. And I am pleased as punch to be able to introduce these three gentlemen to talk about Arizona aviation history. And I think I'll start, we'll, I'll introduce, give you a background with these gentlemen in order of their presentation. So we will start off with Dan O'Toole and Leighton Quarles, who will talk about the overall history of aviation. And then Leighton will definitely give us a little more detail around specific historic sites, especially the Grand Canyon his, uh, Airport. Um, so just a little background on Dan and Leighton. Dan O'Toole is a registered professional archeologist and has worked in the field throughout the United States and in Europe, where he has earned a master's degree in culture and environment from the University of Oslo. Dan has a passion for writing history and is varied in a varied background in different program areas, including archeology, span architectural history, our um, historic preservation, NEPA, visitor management, and climate change studies. He has written and researched a number of historical publications for the National Geographic Books Division, as well as national as National Register nominations, historic context, land use histo histories, cultural resource inventories, determinations of eligibility, and a finding of effects for federal undertakings. Leighton Quarles who might happen to call a co-worker, is a historian with the U.S. Forest Service Enterprise. He grew up in the southwest Montana and is currently calls, calls Prescott, Arizona home. Layton has were, uh, written a numerous, on numerous public lands, histories, and historic preservation topics ranging from Alaska Cold War military property preservations to the administrative, administrative history of Zion National Park. He has currently co-authored a preservation and interpretation plan for the historic Grand Canyon Airport, which I know he's going to go into more detail, and a site evaluation of the Double Circle Ranch and history of fixed wing aviation in the Forest Service Southwest region. Last but not least will be a presentation from Jack Titchler, who will be talking about a unique uh, marking program. Um, and he, Jack is with the, he's a cultural resource project manager uh, with Cornerstone Environmental uh, Consulting, LLC. Jack has worked in the U.S. Southwest and Great Basin since uh, 2014 in the context of archaeological survey, excavation, and historic preservation. 
with specific focus on survey in northern and central Arizona. His experience has focused on ancestral indigenous groups, including the Kohonina and Sinawa, as well as the archaeology of European American westward expansion, including activities related to aviation, logging, railroad, and homesteading. He has also taught archaeology to students, staff, and clients in both academia and the private sector. He received an MA in anthropology from Northern Arizona University, where his research ex ex examined prehistoric landscape relationships in Northern Arizona using G GIS boundary effects analysis. He received a BA in archaeology from Dickinson College, where he focused on classic classical archaeology and language. His um, training includes excavation ground, penetrating radar at the Citadel and lower town of Bronze Age, Mycenae. Um, so, again, thank you to all three of you. You and I first will turn to you. Broke up a bit there at the end, Margaret, but I do presume you passed it to me, correct? Yes, she did. All right, sounds good. I did. I did. You all, I'm in a small town with limited internet access. <laughs> Roger that. So I'm going to share my screen and please confirm that you folks uh, are seeing backcountry historic aviation resources of the Southwest. We are. Great. We got you. So howdy folks, uh, my name is Dan O'Toole, like Margaret mentioned. I was a historian for the Forest Service, uh, working with Leighton and Margaret until recently. I recently moved over to the US Fish and Wildlife Service where I now serve as a regional historic preservation officer. <clears throat> a quick disclaimer uh, that Leighton and I are slash were Forest Service historians. So what follows is a very Forest Service centric discussion of aviation in the Southwest. Uh, there will be some broad brushstrokes applicable to other lands in the Southwest, but you will definitely uh, find that there is very much a focus on Forest Service lands. Hopefully we will cover some points that, have, that are of interest to the broader audience here. Uh, so in the wake of the world's first airplane flight outside of Kitty Hawk, North Carolina in 1903, uh, aviation was for its early decades not considered by many to be much more than a diversion for exhibitionists who performed in so-called air circuses. In the first quarter of the 20th century, air shows and experimental flights occurred in cities and towns of the Southwest that were willing to finance the investment of a small airfield. Uh, it didn't take much in the early days uh, beyond clearing vegetation and rocks in a linear fashion to create a makeshift airstrip. The revolutionary technology of flight was first put to government use in the Southwest between 1916 and the 1920s, when conflicts on the Mexican border elicited the establishment by the U.S. Army of an aerial border patrol and an associated network of airdromes. The Douglas Municipal Airport outside of the Coronado National Forest in Arizona was established in 1928, and it represents one of the world's first international airports in support of the, the U.S. Army effort. Uh, throughout much of its history, the Forest Service has supplied timber to the U.S. Armed Forces for a variety of purposes, including for aircraft. Significant contributions were made by the Forest Service Research Branches Forest Products Laboratory during World War I in the development and testing of spruce wood propellers, wings, and fuselages made for fighter planes. The U.S. Air Fleet of World War I depended on availability of Sitka spruce in the Pacific Northwest for their wooden structural framework. The U.S. Army's Spruce Production Division was formed in 1918 and assigned to National Forests of Washington and Oregon in order to cut Sitka spruce trees for this initiative. The Forest Products Laboratory set out to produce lightweight but strong airplanes, and wood research was greatly accelerated at this time to meet the needs of the war effort. Um, a quick uh, heads up to Leighton. Uh, while I'm sharing my, my slides, I can't see the chat. Um, if there is uh, something that comes up in that chat, uh, somebody please just 
let me know. And I'll keep moving until I hear anything else. So a quick backtrack. Uh, in 1909, a group of National Forest Supervisors at a meeting in El Paso, Texas, passed a resolution that, quote, the use of aircraft in fire patrol of the National Forests was something that should be looked forward to. Uh, this sounds like a rather modest resolution, especially when viewed in hindsight, but it is important to note that this is only four years following the Transfer Act of 1905 that created the U.S. Forest Service, and it's only six years after the first ever successful sustained heavier-than-air flight by the Wright brothers in uh, Kitty Hawk in 1903. So a little Forest Service history in the in the aftermath of the big blow up of 1910, which burned over three million acres of forested lands in uh, mostly Montana and Idaho. The Forest Service began to erect uh, fire lookout towers and telephone lines throughout the backcountry in an effort to detect, report and suppress lightning caused fires as soon as possible after their ignition. The so-called 10 a.m. policy. Uh, you can still find uh, Thai trees throughout uh, the southwest. Uh, where you'll see glass insulators and and cables hanging from high branches of trees, often in the vicinity of backcountry uh, fire crew camps. Uh, it would take 10 years for the network of lookout towers and telephones to be comprehensive enough to actually be effective. And in the meantime, the Forest Service experimented as early as 1917 with the use of aircraft on the Cleveland National Forest in Southern California. As one story goes, Court Dubois, who was then the district forester in California, had a chance encounter with an Army Air Corps major, Henry A. Hap Arnold, then in command of a group of pilots experiencing a loss of purpose in the wake of World War I. The two struck up a conversation. Uh, the major was in search of something useful to keep his pilots occupied in peacetime, while the forester needed a way to expeditiously locate forest fires in the back country of the national forests. This exchange of ideas led to an organized forest fire patrol to spot wildfires from the air over California's Sierra Madre Mountains in 1919. Hap Arnold would go on to become one of the first commanding generals of an independent U.S. Air Force. And this photo is from a little bit later, uh, but does depict a uh, forest supervisor in the uh, jollipers of the time, uh, talking with a very Clark Gable looking pilot in Southern California. So the Southwest has hosted aviation infrastructure and airstrips for much of the 20th century, uh, but often uh, development in the Southwest uh, was in the wake of innovation that originated elsewhere. Uh, as mentioned, aerial fire patrols originated in California and the Pacific Northwest in 1919, and they were eventually adopted by the Southwestern region of the Forest Service following World War II. Uh, here are some early biplane aerial patrols of the Pacific Northwest. Um, open cockpits were still the norm. So we get uh, heavy leather jackets and furry hats on the left and uh, and some mechanics there on the right. And uh, Leighton, I was mentioning earlier, I'm not sure if you heard, but if there anything, I can't see the chat. If anything comes up and you wanna, you wanna butt in while I'm uh, uh, discussing something, just feel free. Roger, Bo, we won't do that to you, Dan. Let's save all that until the end. Roger that. See where I am. The southwestern region has utilized aviation for firefighting, transport, supply drops, seed drops, aerial application of herbicides and pesticides, uh, which is not a current use, but it, it was a big use of aviation in the Forest Service uh, in the 1960s and thereabouts. Also, aerial surveys are, are uh, a large uh, function of aviation in the Forest Service. But all these uses were innovated elsewhere before being adopted in the southwestern region. Notable exceptions to this trend are events and practices that owe their origins to construction and use of the historic Grand Canyon Airport at Red Butte. And we will be hearing more about that site from Leighton uh, to follow. So early professional aviators of the southwest took jobs making maps, taking aerial photographs, hauling cargo, and carrying passengers. As railroads continued to, per to push further into the interior stretches of the American West, tourism to the parks and forests of the Southwest became a booming business. Aircraft did not require quite the investment in infrastructure as did trains, 
and the field of fixed wing aviation was eager, albeit slow, to enter into the industry. One of the Forest Service's first forays into commercial airstrip construction was part of a bid to attract tourists and visitors to the Grand Canyon area. In 1927, the Kaibab, Kaibab National Forest permitted 768 acres along Highway 64, 11 miles south of Tucson. Excuse me, I don't live in Arizona. If I'm mispronouncing the name of the town, I apologize. Um, that was uh, 768 acres permitted to a new airfield. The airfield was named Red Butte after a nearby peak sacred to the Havasupai tribe. Construction commenced on the historic Grand Canyon Airport at Red Butte almost immediately, and by March 1928, facilities were complete. Scenic Airways was open for business by June of 1928 and was soon engaged in passenger flights as well as exploratory, photographic, charter, and airmail flights, and even one cinematic flight to film Romance of the Colorado River. In 1929, Scenic Airways assisted the Forest Service in, in an airlift of eight deer from the north rim of the Grand Canyon down to Red Butte in an effort to reestablish healthy uh, population numbers on the south rim. This was one of the first of many airlifts in support of re animal reintroduction programs, a practice that is uh, quite common to the present day. On another note, uh, following World War I, airmail became a driving impetus for the establishment of aviation infrastructure in the Southwest and elsewhere. Uh, undeveloped mesas of national forests of the Southwestern region were utilized as stopovers for airmail planes operated by the U.S. Army between 1920 and 1925. Even when there was developed airstrips along airmail routes, there needed to be emergency landing uh, facilities in between um, air uh, airmail airstrips. So uh, lots of times undeveloped land was used as emergency landing. Um, such is the case of Aeroplane Mesa on the Gila National Forest, which has never hosted a developed airstrip, but was generally flat and dry enough for a landing. At some point prior to 1924, one General Chenault, an early mail carrier for the U.S. Army, crashed on takeoff and was forced to abandon his Liberty Engine aircraft, which has lent the Mesa its name ever since, even though the wreck was later burned on site. A rash of airplane crashes and pilot deaths during the period of airmail delivery by the U.S. Army gained national attention and elicited a shift over to civilian contractors. Uh, in 1925, the Airmail Act, also known as the Kelly Act, gave the Post Office Department the authority to contract out mail delivery services to private operations in order to encourage commercial aviation. Uh, this law standardized mail services and organized the national system into numbered contract air mail or CAM routes. CAM route number 34 from Los Angeles to New York, passing over Northern Arizona and New Mexico along the Ash Fork, Ash Fork Topeka Railroad route was inaugurated in 1930. Transcontinental and Western Air, TWA, was awarded the contract for CAM route number 34. It was the last of the nationally designated CAM routes to be awarded. The transition of aerial mail activities from the federal government to civilian contractors using established air mail lines was at this point in place across the country as of 1930. Uh, there were major trends in aviation that followed as a result of the privatization of air mail services. One such trend was the need for regional aviation companies to merge in order to become competitive bidders for transcontinental air mail service. This led directly to the formation of modern commercial airlines as we know them today. A 1930 amendment to the Airmail Act, the McNary Waters Act, overhauled the requirements for being awarded an airmail contract and ensured that only the big four of the domestic U.S. airlines, American, United, Eastern, and TWA, would fit the bill. This controversial series of events would come to be known as the airmail scandal or the airmail fiasco for the negative effect it had on the competitiveness of smaller independent airlines. Nevertheless, even after congressional cancellation of the 1930 amendment, issuance of a new airmail act in 1934, and passage of the Civil Aeronautics Act of 1938, the original restructuring of the commercial aviation industry into the big four continued to receive validation with an emphasis on government corporate linkages, limited competition, and restricted entry 
to the industry. Uh, we still feel the effects of this consolidation to the present day, though uh, Though there's been some more recent uh, news on that front. Uh, but as of 1932, it was it was four four commercial airlines that uh, and only four that could maintain competitiveness to uh, engage in this industry. Another major byproduct of the privatization of airmail services was the growth of the National Air Marking Program, a public works program that produced a national network of aviation infrastructure, must, much of which was located on public lands, including National Forest System lands. We will hear more about the specifics of this program from Jack in a little bit. Predecessors of this program date back to at least as early as 1923, when first instituted by the Postal Service. Uh, building on established precedent, the National Air Marking Program was established in 1933 to coordinate the, the construction of an air marker under airline routes every 15 miles in every direction across the country. So early airmail planes operated without modern navigation systems or radar, instead depending on landmarks by day and lighted beacons by night, an in-flight practice referred to as contact flying. Often these landmarks or air markers were numbers, letters, or symbols painted on the roofs of buildings along the airmail routes. These rooftop markers were the preferred method of air marking since they were highly visible, especially when installed on prominent buildings, and they were relatively easy and cost-effective to install. Forest Service buildings, especially lookout towers located in remote areas on exposed mountaintops and ridgelines, provided optimal roof surfaces for installation of air markers in the backcountry, where few other public buildings were located. Where roofs were in short supply, white painted rock alignments laid out as directional arrows and numbers or letters sufficed as well. If sizable rocks were not abundant, bricks, gravel, or painted wood were also utilized. And uh, like I mentioned, we'll hear more about this program from Jack in a bit. So ground-based air markers were functional by day, but did not serve to make flying at night any easier or safer. So a system of lighted beacon towers illuminating established aerial pathways was the solution of the times. The earliest beacon tower stations of the 1920s resembled the wooden frameworks of fire lookout towers, but a standard design for airway beacon stations was established by 1931 that included a 51-foot airway tower, a generator shed with beacon numbers painted on the roof, and a concrete arrow pointing in the direction of the next beacon. The Transcontinental Air Transport Company, TAT, installed the first flight beacon stations in the southwestern region in 1929 in support of their transcontinental passenger service. In 1930, the TAT was forced to merge with four other airlines to form TWA. Once awarded the contract for cam route number 34 in 1930, TWA set themselves to fund safety improvements across the entire route including additional beacon tower stations between, Kings, between Kingman and Winslow, Arizona. Uh, moving on to another topic, uh, aviation crashes and emergency landings were not an uncommon occurrence in the early days of flight in the Southwest and across the country. Uh, though by no means exclusive to national forest lands, the mountainous terrain of the Western National Forest certainly contributed to the challenges of contact flying prior to the age of modern air traffic control. Some aviation crashes of the Southwestern region produced infamy in their own day, such as the story of Leo the Lion, whose roars still introduce MGM motion pictures. In the aftermath of the first solo nonstop transatlantic flight by Charles Lindbergh in May of 1927, MGM studio executives concocted a publicity stunt to fly their mascot, Leo the Lion, an actual 350-pound African lion, from Southern California to New York in a B-1 Ryan Brougham monoplane, similar to that piloted by Lindbergh for his record-setting flight just four months earlier. To contain the animal, the plane's passenger section was outfitted with a steel-barred cage with plate glass slides for ease of viewing into the spectacle. Martin Jensen, a well-known aviator and stunt pilot, was hired to fly the plane, though contact with Jensen was lost not long after takeoff take on September 16, 1927. The New York Times reported no word from plane carrying movie Lion. Though the B-1 Ryan Brougham was amongst the finest aircraft of its day, it was not equipped to accommodate 300 gallons of fuel, a 350-pound Lion, and an additional 400 pounds of plate glass surrounding the Lion's cage. The plane was 
unable to gain enough altitude outside of Phoenix to clear the muggy on rim. And so Jensen maneuvered the aircraft into a controlled crash in what was then known as Hell's Canyon outside of Payson, Arizona, in today's Tonto National Forest. The plane was wrecked, but Leo's cage and Jensen himself were still intact. After feeding Leo his sandwiches and milk, Jensen started hiking down canyon in search of help. Uh, he returned with a rescue party six days later to find the lion hungry, thirsty, and maggoty, but still alive. The rescue party hoisted Leo, still in his cage, onto a makeshift sled and hauled the cage with a team of mules to the nearest road from which he was trucked to Payson, then on back to Burbank, California. As of 1982, the wreckage was still lying in what was known, what was at that point known as Leo Canyon. Uh, here is uh, one of the uh, firsts in Southwest aviation, uh, at least in terms of Forest Service involvement in Southwest aviation. The first transport of personnel to respond to a wildfire occurred in 1929, leaving Winslow, Arizona with four firefighters and arriving two days later in Butte, Montana to join the forces fighting the Half Moon Fire on the Blackfeet National Forest. Just six days later, more personnel were requested. A second Southwestern crew flew on a Ford tri-motor, which was operated by Scenic Airways out of the historic Grand Canyon Airport at Red Butte. That's the uh, airplane seen here in 1929. Due to the lack of visibility from wildfire smoke, the plane landed in Salt Lake City, from which the firefighting crew took a train to Butte, Montana. A few weeks later, firefighters were requested once more. Twelve men attending an annual forest ranger training at the Fort Valley Experiment Station flew out of the old Coke, airport, uh, the old Coke field near Flagstaff. In total, 21 southwestern region firefighters flew to Montana in 1929, a practice which has continued unabated to the present day. The Forest Service is well known for its innovation in the training and use of smoke jumpers, firefighters who parachute from aircraft into remote and inaccessible areas in order to contain backcountry wildfires. The first practical smoke jumps to fight active wildfires occurred in 1940 over the Nez Perce National Forest in Idaho. The success of the practice informed the training and tactics of paratrooper units operating dur during World War II. The first military paratroopers use techniques and equipment developed by the Forest Service. One of these paratrooper units, the 555th Parachute Infantry Battalion, AKA the Triple Nickels, uh, was an all African-American unit, and they were assigned the task of putting out forest fires set by incendiary balloons sent from Japan to the west coast of North America. The Triple Nickels made 1,200 jumps in 1945 alone and helped to suppress 36 fires. They were an essential part of the Forest Service's efforts to address the threat of Japanese balloon bombs. They became pioneers in smoke jumping, and some of the methods that they developed are still in use today. Smoke jumpers were used in the southwestern region for the first time in 1946, and they were based out of Deming, New Mexico at first. Uh, they were placed there in order to be available to be dispatched to the wide expanses of the Gila and Mimbrace wildernesses. The New Mex crew, as it was known, successfully attacked fires caused by lightning in the Gila and Apache National Forests. They were utilized primarily in the mountainous area around the Arizona-New Mexico border. Given the dearth of maintenance facilities in New Mexico at the time, pilots from Montana had to haul south all of their own maintenance equipment and spare parts. Uh, the southwestern region no longer hosts a smoke jumper crew in the area. In the immediate decade following World War II, there was technology sufficient to construct airstrips in remote locations, and there was a national level push on the part of the Forest Service to locate fire suppression crews near airports. The Gila Interregional Fire Suppression Crew was formed between 1968 and 1970, with its base of operations at the Negrito Work Center on the Gila National Forest in New Mexico. The Gila Interregional Fire Suppression Crew was the first of its kind in the southwestern region, and among the first 15 of its kind in the American West. This seasonal crew's expressed purpose was to perform difficult assignments in high fire danger situations. They were to be highly trained, well-equipped, and strategically placed near Negrito airstrip on the Gila National Forest for rapid deployment, primarily across the southwestern region, but also across the country as needed. Today known as the Gila Interagency Hotshot Crew, they are one of 15 hotshot crews that work out of the southwest region. And so here are some maps that I created in support of a project that I worked on with Layton. 
um, just mapping out, uh, accessing as much data as I could, primarily from FAA to map out where these backcountry airstrips occur, primarily on national forest lands in Arizona and New Mexico. Uh, you can see that the red airplane icons are backcountry airstrips used by Recreational Aviation Foundation, who was our partner in this project. Those are not necessarily FAA regulated airfields. They are backcountry airstrips, some of which do not resemble much more than a road. Uh, the blue airplane icons are FAA regulated airfields located within Forest Service administrative boundaries. It does not mean that they occur on national forest lands. Many of them are located within inholdings uh, surrounded by national forest lands. And then the brown directional blobs are runways located outside of Forest Service administrative boundaries across the Southwest region. I could not guarantee to you that this is a comprehensive look at every single runway in the Southwest, but it's uh, pretty much as close as I could get to that. And, uh, and that's where I'll leave it for my presentation and uh, pass it over to Leighton. Thanks, Dan. That was fantastic. Um, do we want to have questions for Dan right now while this uh, is we're going to do it? We're going to do it at the end later. Gotcha. Thank you, Donna. So um, if they have questions, please put them in the chat. Sweet. Okay, let's see if I can actually do this right. That would mean I have to open this fully. There we go. All righty then. Well, friends, this is a trifle disorganized, perhaps, but welcome to a presentation on aviation uh, at the Grand Canyon and really the Grand Canyon Airport, which today is probably known pretty well by this crowd, but not really by any other crowd. So um, place because we don't see anything on the screen. You're about to. Okay. You are indeed about to. It is not by accident. It is my disorganization. I'll pretend there's method to that madness. Yeah, you guys, I'm moving fully into position here. Alrighty then. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let me say slideshow. We will share the screen. Oh, look at that. All right. Can everybody see it? Yeah, we can see it, Layden. Outstanding. <clears throat> Pardon me. So, Dan has given you this excellent, broader conception of uh, some Southwestern aviation. And I'm going to focus on a site that is is on Forest Service land on the Kaibab National Forest. Um, but really, I'm not going to talk a lot about the Forest Service itself. Instead, I'm going to look at one of the sites that the Forest Service uh, permitted and has uh, continued to host for nearly 100 years now. And that's uh, what is known today as the historic Grand Canyon Airport. The historic Grand Canyon Airport is uh, also known, especially by those of you who have read uh, the late Jacinta Bradley Kuntz's work um, as the Red Butte Airport or the Red Butte Aerodrome. This is not a terminology I use much because it does not appear much in historic documents that I have seen. However, works just fine. And this is the eponymous Red Butte. We're looking south here at the historic hangar. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the buildings, but I'm mostly going to talk about aviation at Grand Canyon and this Grand Canyon Airport in the broader context because, well, I'm sort of an academic historian and I can't help it. So, I'm me, in case you forgot. 
By the way, this cheesy picture was taken at the Double Circle Ranch, uh, one of the sites that Dan O'Toole just mentioned uh, on a site survey for another wonderful old uh, ranch and airstrip on the Apache Sitgreaves National Forest, sort of between Clifton and Alpine. What is the historic Grand Canyon Airport? It was the first airport in the Grand Canyon area. And what I mean by that is that it was the first airport on the north or the south rim um, by a good 10 years, well, a good eight years, really. And it predated uh, substantially used air facilities in Flagstaff. It certainly predated any uh, substantially used air facilities in Southern Utah. Um, and it even predated uh, facilities in Las Vegas, which with, with which it was later associated, because Las Vegas has traditionally been one of the key population centers associated with Grand Canyon tourism, and especially Grand Canyon air tourism. The historic Grand Canyon airport uh, consists of an airplane hangar built between 1927 and 1928. A duplex guest cabin built in 28, and the ruins of a small lodge erected that same year with a masonry sign structure two and a half miles away. If you want to go look at it yourself, the airfield is on Forest Service Road 305 on the Kaibab National Forest, about two and a half miles east of Highway 64 and 19 miles south of the south rim of the Grand Canyon. Um... And this is really quite a wonderful structure to study and ultimately we hope to preserve and interpret because it's what we would call a significant historic landscape. It showcases a number of important intersections of Arizona land use and transportation history. I occupied first and longest by indigenous people. The Grand Canyon Airport lies adjacent to Red Butte which is a sacred place to the Havasupai tribe. Uh, the Havasupais were forcibly asked to leave, is the kindest and weakest way to put it, uh, really beginning in the 1880s, but have gradually begun to reassert their presence on the land. Uh, 20th century Arizonans constructed the Exit Airport facility uh, really in the waning years of the Roaring Twenties to open up air transportation for commercial purposes to the Grand Canyon area. Over a 40-year period, the airport hosted numerous visitors who came to recreate as well as celebrities, among them Amelia Earhart, Eleanor Roosevelt, and the comedian Wiley Post. Today, the site's really composed of the original airplane hangar, staff housing, and uh, lodge ruins a few hundred yards away. Faint remnants of the earth and runways that are best really viewed from Google Earth and the masonry sign structure I mentioned. You can't beat the setting. It's a secluded and beautiful meadow surrounded by ponderosa pines and pinyon juniper, so right at the intersection with Red Butte just to the south and the San Francisco peaks in the southeastern distance. <clears throat> so I'm giving you the, the Cliffs Notes overview, and then I'll go back a little bit, and I'll look at the context of aviation more broadly uh, in Grand Canyon transportation history and land use history. So who ran it? Very briefly. Uh, the initial outfit to operate the Grand Canyon Airport was a company called Scenic Airways, which was an early casualty of the Great Depression. You see, they survived into 1930. Uh, they were revived by Grand Canyon Airlines, which changed its name in the mid-30s to Grand Canyon Boulder Dam Tours. Um, and that entity itself ultimately succumbed to the long-running depression six years later. I, th I think the title, Grand Canyon Boulder Dam Tours, really indicates the expanding touristic landscape that they were working with. Uh, ultimately, Grand Canyon Boulder Dam Tours based themselves out of Boulder City, Nevada, rather than the middle of nowhere on the Coconino Plateau. 
Uh, not Fentanyl, g g Airlines ran it uh, with a five-year war hiatus uh, from the end of the 30s into 1951. Uh, when the Hudgen brothers of Tucson, um, who actually had some money and some stick to uh, purchased the site, they renamed uh, the Operation Grand Canyon Airlines in 1957. And Grand Canyon Airlines continues today, albeit with a somewhat tenuous corporate history. Uh, the facility, however, no longer hosted anybody after 1967. <clears throat> So I'm going to back up real quick, and I'm going to talk a little bit about transportation on the Colorado Plateau. Um, you know, aviation is merely the latest in a long, a long arc of Colorado Plateau transportation here. I've got a picture of Beale's Wagon Road, which is a famous pre-Civil War uh, attempt to knit California together with the rest of the United States at that time. Uh, and this runs directly across the southern portion of the Kaibab National Forest and the Coconino National Forest and really helped bring non-Indigenous people into the area uh, to take over what is now Arizona. There was some fun stuff with camels too, but that's another story. Uh, there we go. Oh, come on. So... You know, Native people have traded across the Colorado Plateau for, safe to say, many hundreds of years and probably a lot longer than that, and really linked goods and cultures from as far away as northern Utah and central Mexico. Um, Spanish priests traversed the South Rim as early as 1776. Um But Beals really paved the way for United States expansion and ultimately became uh provided the guideline for what became Route 66, the Santa Fe Railway and Interstate 40 today. Not the exact same road, but the general area. One thing that's important to remember with this is that much of the area's transportation infrastructure was driven by tourism. Um the Modern Santa Fe Railway, which at the time was a subsidiary called the Atlantic and Pacific, brought rail access to the Colorado Plateau as early as the 1880s. And by 1882, you could take a train from Chicago to Los Angeles right across the Coconino Plateau. Um, the Grand Canyon Railway, which is pleasantly recently revived in Williams, uh, passed only a few miles west of what of the present site of the Grand Canyon Airport and was opened by 1901. So you've already got persistent tourist access to the South Rim by 1901. By the by 1920, the area was crisscrossed with roads. Modern routes uh, were really coming into existence. So yay for that, right? One of the primary drivers of transportation development, including aviation, hardly the only, but one of the primary, um, and also of early use of the Grand Canyon Airport was the National Park Service through Grand Canyon National Park, of course, which was founded or formally established in 1919, but had been aiming for national park status uh, by 1919 for at least 25 years, uh, both through its tenure with the Forest Service and the Park Service. Oh, and you can see that aviation uh, by the late 20s and early 30s was really uh, something that the Park Service was using um, for its own management purposes. Uh, here's a little quote from Horace Albright, director of the National Park Service from his annual report of 1932. Essentially, without Grand Canyon National Park, there would be no Grand Canyon Airport. So here we have the melding of sightseeing purposes, uh, boosting business, the airline, and uh, future concepts of perhaps using aviation more in national parks, which ultimately did not pan out. And of course, running into that, it, by far the most significant economic development in the Grand Canyon area, as I've just said, but I just can't overemphasize it, is, is Grand Canyon National Park. It's 
absolutely enormous. Resource extraction and grazing are big stuff and they're worth mentioning. Um, but really Grand Canyon has been the motor of Coconino Plateau development. Um, the historic Grand Canyon Airport was established expressly to take advantage of the Grand Canyon's popularity with tourists and to provide air access to the to the Grand Canyon. Uh, in 1928, the year the historic Grand Canyon Airport opened, the park received 167,000 visitors and change and was the fifth most visited national park in the United States. Uh, today, Grand Canyon visitation tends to sit between six and seven million and makes it, without competition, the second most heavily visited national park in the country. In other words, business is good. Now, we'll step back very briefly, but only very briefly, and just remind folks of other land uses. And part of the reason I mention this is that the historic Grand Canyon Airport today sits on a Forest Service grazing permit, which is actively in use, or if not actively was a couple of years ago. So there's always been intersection and competition between multiple uses here on the Coconino Plateau. Uh, really, cattle grazing livestock grazing in general, uh, including sheep, began in the 1870s uh, in large numbers. And you all know Babbitt Ranches, I suspect, and the other big cattle companies, a couple of which have still survived today. Um, but really, the federal government began to regulate grazing by permit as early as 1893 when the Grand Canyon Forest Reserve was established, and the Forest Service is still very much in that business. Whee! Of course, logging has been the motor of the Williams economy, or a motor, for a hundred years and change now. And really, commercial lumbering began only a few years after livestock grazing began in a major way, in the 1880s. Um, Flagstaff and Williams essentially did double duty as lumber centers and railroad towns. Of course, one facilitates the other. Uh, and again, just as with with grazing, by the 20th century, the Forest Service was regulating lumbering in the area. So this is very much an area where multiple uses intersect and where the federal government is fundamentally the arbiter of much of the land use. Uh, major lumber companies for lumber geeks uh, in the early years were the Arizona Lumber and Timber Company, the Flagstaff Lumbering and Manufacturing Company and the Saginaw and Manistee Lumber Company, and that should give you a notion of the kind of cross-United States business that was being done um, with lumber. Saginaw and Manistee, of course, being in Michigan. Mining, of course. Yay for mining. Sorry, you guys, I had a really cool mining picture, and it got corrupted, and due to my ineptitude, I couldn't put in place it quick enough. Uh, you know, mining is always big news in the Grand Canyon area as those of us who are following the fresh controversy over the new national monument can attest. And indeed, there is a uranium mine just a couple of miles outside the Grand Canyon airport, the Canyon mine. Oh, come on. Where are we? Now, and I've mentioned the have a soup pie connection right this is very much indigenous land then and now and now we're gonna have some fun pictures because i'm just a sucker for fun pictures um so th this is this shot from uh probably about 1935 show or no actually about 1930 shows a scenic airways aircraft over the grand canyon here and i believe that's the shiny new navajo bridge well, I guess that would be over Marble Canyon, wouldn't it? Sorry, guys. Um, I just, I just think it's, it's a wonderful indication that even, you know, 95 years ago, you've already got highway development in place, including bridges over one of the larger canyons in the United States and aviation right there with it. And, you know, within 30 years, uh, dam development as well. Uh, now, the Grand Canyon Airport was associated in its very early years with uh, sort of a who's who of aviation pioneers and Hollywood big and middle wigs and generally prominent American persons. 
Uh, Charles Lindbergh was associated with the development and the promotion of the Grand Canyon Airport. But it is unclear in a matter of some, some debate whether he was actually there. He may have been, but one particularly contentious and convinced historian uh, tells me that actually this wonderful shot, which they say is at the Grand Canyon Airport, was at the now gone hangar in Winslow. That's for folks to, uh, if anybody wants to educate me on that, go for it. But suffice it to say, Charles Lindbergh, uh, Will Rogers, who was famously killed with the uh, avi early aviator Wiley Post, uh, not long after this, actually, up near what used to be Barrow, Alaska. These were household names in the late 20s and early 30s. Now, of course, these were not the first aviators in the Grand Canyon area, and they were not even the first promoters of tourism in the Grand Canyon area to think about airplanes. Uh, Ellsworth Kolb, one of the famous Kolb brothers who helped develop Grand Canyon Village and promote early 20th century Grand Canyon tourism, is seen here with um, a military flyer, Lieutenant Thomas, uh, on probably the earliest flight over mm, not the earliest one of the earliest flights over the canyon they actually landed that thing at indian gardens and that was uh a little hairy by all accounts and when i say famous i mean famous right so you've got charles Lindbergh. we think Lindbergh was there amelia Earhart not only visited the grand canyon airport more than once but she ultimately hired away its engine rebuilder and tech uh, to work on her aircraft before her ill-fated attempt to fly across the Pacific Ocean. So it's fun stuff. If you're interested in bigger names, there's definitely more to dig. There was a famous uh, female air pilot named Amy, uh, female pilot and racer named Amy Mollison, who also frequented the area. And, you know, dogs, right? Little pets. I think that's someone's pet deer, along with the dog. Um, and for you airplane geeks, that's a Travel Air 6000A, and there are still a few flying around. It's a, essentially, it's a just the right size small aircraft uh, for sightseeing. You're not going to hold about six people. And in the mid 20s, it was quite a sophisticated aircraft with a radial engine and an enclosed cabin. Uh, the Army, we we'll call it the Army Air Corps if you want, in the 20s and the early 30s, also used uh, the historic Grand Canyon Airport for some of its cross-country flights uh, as a stop-off. I really enjoy this picture. And if anybody knows what this airplane is, I spent like three hours trying to identify it, and I just couldn't, but it's such a cool picture, and it's from the very, very early years. That's probably 1929 or 1930. Now, you can notice, I'll touch on this just for a moment, you can notice with this hangar, which is really the centerpiece of the site, the hangar was a fancy piece of business. It was designed uh, by the same guy who designed the original Sky Harbor Airport and left his imprint around the United States. It's in this classic design that you see really up through World War II. It was fully enclosed. It had an office a little spot to relax, and even a machine shop uh, where sophisticated engine work could be done. Um, so it really was, it wasn't just a gas station. Yeah, it was a dirt strip, but so were things in New York City and Los Angeles. So you could get any work you needed done at this place. And it was part of the a wider network of early aviation tourism, which really aped the model that the Fred Harvey company and its com competition had already developed in northern Arizona and northern New Mexico, wherein they used these central points, whether they were railroad depots or airports, for wider touristic ventures, especially like out on the Navajo Nation, essentially to uh, give middle class passengers a chance to uh, go out and gawk and sightsee and buy some nice jewelry and also as a small way to help boost the Navajo Nation economy of course 
Mind you, weather was a little challenging, as anyone um, who lives on the Coconino Plateau can attest. This morning, with a little snow on the ground, um, it most certainly snowed at the Grand Canyon Airport. The weather was at least as violent as it was in Flagstaff. And yet, they were often staffed year-round. This one just made me laugh. This is just sort of like a cheesy, feel-good picture. I love this kid. That wing behind him is from a Ford Tri-Motor. Um, through a deal with the Ford Motor Company, which flirted with getting into aviation in the late 20s and early 30s until the Fokker Company sued them for copyright infringement. Uh, both Scenic Airways and their successors primarily used the uh, early Ford Tri-Motor aircraft. So a very distinctive aircraft from a distinctive pre-war aviation period. Uh, this is Gene Tisso, who was the machinist that Amelia Earhart hired away. You know, he's a serious mechanic. He wears a white coat, right? Um, this is a photo taken just a couple of years ago, and you can really see that it has fallen upon hard times. And it, it's unfortunate to see that, but the current owners um, are working with the Forest Service and have some plans and hopes to restore this and perhaps even interpret it to the public. All of that is very much ongoing and remains to be seen, but nonetheless, heartening, I think. Let's see if I can bounce through. Now, how do you get to this place, right? Well... You look for the sign, and the signage was great. They've got this wonderful winged sign. This was in place by sometime in the early 30s. I don't believe it was in place in the 20s, but it was certainly in by probably 1935. This says turn off the highway, and you know you're close because as soon as you turn off at this sign, you're greeted by this wonderful sort of classic quasi-military monument that you would find at a national park like Sequoia or Kings Canyon. With a little bitty ticket booth inside. There's a little little window in here, a little tiny room. And it's landscaped a little bit. And you and here's Red Butte in the background. Um, so you can come in off the highway from Williams, go off to the airport, or you can drive right back out onto the highway and go up past what is now Tucson to the south rim. Uh, and this place had pretty good runways that could accommodate fairly large aircraft for the day. Um, as late as 1964, they were still listing uh, runway lengths, which by that point were short, but certainly able to accommodate something like a DC-3. Uh, they had four runways at this little bitty airport in the middle of nowhere, including one that was 9,000 feet long. I don't think you'd... <laughs> it was not paved, and there were gopher holes, but it was there. Now, the really, the heyday of the Grand Canyon Airport, what, despite its very high turnover of ownership, really was in the 19, was between 1928 and, and World War II. It opened right after the war with grand aspirations. TWA even incorporated it as a stop. And it just couldn't really make anybody enough money to consistently operate it. Um Near as we understand through historical research, it was not negatively impacted by the horrific air accident in the in 1956, uh, where you know two aircraft collided over the Grand Canyon and things rained down into the canyon and the river. In fact, it was used as a uh, an evidence and you know pieces debris and bodies collection point. This is still a great photo. I love it. And this is, by the way, for local history folks, uh, if you want to see more material like this, this is from the wonderful little archives that the Williams Historical Society and Margaret Hangen and folks who work with her have put together. And you can really see here, the uh, you can see where you could bring in an aircraft as large as a Ford Tri-Motor right into the front. And here's your classy ticket office. You walk inside buy your ticket, sit on the couch, have a cup of coffee. Machine shops over on the far side. 
the lodge, which is long gone and we have no very good of, is on the far side. And not to worry, folks, I'm just done. Oh, somebody's already in. Good. And this picture I like because it gives a little better sense of the whole site. This was never a very large operation. This was just a few little buildings sitting out right at the edge of the forest. This shot's really looking east, east, southeast. The San Francisco peaks would be just to the right here around your uh, tree. And Red Butte would be a little farther to the right yet. Landscape looks largely unchanged today. This building is gone. Now, there's so much more that I would love to tell you guys about this, and I probably could have organized this better, but I really wanted to just introduce you to what is, I think, is really a little treasure from, yeah, golden years is such a poor phrase, but from, from a really remarkable early period in Arizona and Southwest aviation history, not least because it can tell such wonderful stories about wider things like aviation history, tourism history, the intersection between public land use and private industry, all this wonder, you know, wonderful topics that can really inform how we understand and interact with the world today. And plus, it's awesome. And you could go drive to it. And if you're very respectful, you can drive up to the gate and look past it and enjoy it. And it's still there. And we hope that greater things will happen for it in the future. Thank you so much. I'm going to try to stop sharing. Right. Did it work? Theoretically. Yes, I think we'll stop. I'm going to jump in here and remind folks I'm not seeing any questions in the chat just yet. So just reminding folks to please, please put your questions in the chat. And uh, we'll uh, allow Jack, as soon as Leighton's done sharing, we'll allow Jack to, a moment to get his presentation up. Sorry, attack of fumble fingeredness. Jack, I'm out. It's all you. Sounds good. Thanks. No worries. Yeah, everybody see that all right? We got you. Great. First off, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Leighton. Very interesting talks there. Um, learned a lot. Uh, my name is Jack Treichler. I'm an archaeologist with Cornerstone Environmental Consulting out of Flagstaff, Arizona. And today I'm going to be giving a quick talk. It's a version of a talk that I gave at the Society for American Archaeology Conference in 2019. And it's a subject of some ongoing research that I'm doing as well. But uh, I'll be talking today about historic air markers in northern Arizona. Dan gave a little bit of an update or a introduction to that already. I'll be digging into it in a little more detail, starting with some historic background on the National Air Marking Program and then going into some details on specific air marker sites that, uh, that I've identified with the help of some other folks as well in Ash Fork, Clemenceau, Maine, Phoenix, and Winslow. And then I'm gonna give a little discussion kind of tying those two things together in, in how they may or may not be connected. So, the National Air Marking Program was a federal program. It was started by Phoebe only in the early 1930s as a subdivision of the Bureau of Air Commerce and only hired four female pilots to help her with it, including the most prominent member of the program, Blanche Noyes, pictured here. And their goal was to install a marker for the nearest town or airport every 15 miles across the country, painted on rooftops if possible, but if not uh, installed via painted uh, rocks or wood in more rural areas where there were not those rooftops available. The idea being, again, that this was the 1930s, 40s. This was prior to more sophisticated uh, radio or radar-based navigation. And so most flying was done via contact flying, that is looking for landmarks on the ground and navigating accordingly. And any number of things, including inclement weather, et cetera, could very easily lead to pilots getting lost. 
And if a pilot was lost and could not safely land at an airport, there were quite likely fatal consequences. So this, this was really a public safety initiative uh, launched by these women to establish uh, a navigation network based off of air markers on the ground across the country. It was notable because this program, the National Air Marking Program, was the first US government program conceived, planned, and directed by a woman with an all woman staff. Uh, one of the pilots was uh, Helen McCloskey, and uh, she commented, why did they choose girls to do this work? I expect because there are still few enough women pilots in the country, they think we could do a better job of selling the interests of private flying. The, uh, all the pilots here from uh, left to right were Louis Theden, uh, Helen McCloskey, Blanche Noyes, and Helen Ritchie. While these pilots, oops, sorry, while these pilots coordinated the uh, construction, give that a second. They coordinated the construction. However, the labor itself was done by a variety of other other groups, including uh, the Civilian Conservation Corps, Civic Volunteers, the Works Progress Administration. Um, but the pilots, including Blanche Noyes, were the ones who flew around the country and really coordinated the entire endeavor. Uh, this article is from 1938 when she visited Phoenix. Uh, she commented at that point that Arizona had 143 airworkers across the state and that they were continuing to build more. Work, strop, work on this project stopped abruptly in 1941. So with the Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor, the government quickly became concerned that with the possibility of uh, enemy bombers flying over the continental United States, it might not be the best idea to have markers every 15 miles pointing to our significant airports. So in 1942, in January, the War Department directed that all air markers within 150 miles of the coast uh, be obliterated and destroyed, and that no new ones be started during the war. At this point, uh, the air marking program itself was reporting that there were uh, about 13,000 markers completed across the, the United States, which, uh, based off some back of the napkin math, uh, that would equate to about one marker every 15 miles. So it seems like the, the program was largely successful in its stated goal. But then by 1942, uh, Blanche had to start uh, flying across these coastal areas and uh, working on obliterating the markers. This was at some personal risk to herself as it involved her flying through uh, heavily guarded air airways and risking being misidentified as an enemy combatant. After the war, the air marking program resumed, but in a much more limited fashion. So that was due to the great improvements in navigation that were made during World War II, including navigation by uh, radar, by radio waves, et cetera. So pilots were much less reliant on contact flying following the war. But for a few years, uh, you know, the Civil Aeronautics Administration did put out a bulletin with guidelines for how to construct air markers. Again, the preference was to put them on roofs, as pictured here, because that was the more visible option. But they also had the option of installing them via crushed rock or wooden markers in more rural areas where that was not available. This is a uh, one of the illustrated figures that they put out as a recommendation for how they might be assembled. And there is one of these possibly extant still outside of Phoenix, Arizona, I'm not sure the exact history of this one, but it does resemble the guidelines that the uh, Civil Aeronautics Administration put out, although perhaps not finished through to completion. But it is still around there. And records relating to the National Air Marking Program, uh, in the National Archives anyway, end about 1953. So it seems likely it was around then that the program started to wind down. Again, it was not quite as needed anymore due to the advances in uh, radio and radar navigation. 
So with that uh, kind of background on the air marketing program, I'm, I'm gonna move on to some specific sites throughout Northern Arizona here that I've checked out. First one is Ash Fork. This one's in uh, Yavapai County. It's on the Kaibab National Forest. And uh, the site itself is a is made of large block letters, about 15 feet tall, uh, about 270 feet long overall. It's made of uh, basalt boulders and cobble construction. And it's pointing up towards what would have been an a, a landing a landing strip at Ash Fork, uh, which is up to the north northwest of this site. Uh, these landing strips appear on aeronautical section markers, as shown here from the 1930s and 40s. Uh, there's no longer any airstrip there at, at Ash Fork. This particular site is not very visible from the air anymore. Uh, this is the approximate location of it. It's quite overgrown by uh, pinion and juniper trees. But on the ground, you can see there are these big block letters, A, S, H, F-O-R-K, arrow symbol, number 12. And that is pointing approximately towards where that Ash Fork airfield would have been in the 1930s and 40s, and that is the approximate mileage. This is what it lo looks like on the ground. There's not too much to see. But this is one of the figures. You can see a rock alignment here, another rock alignment to the rear, and a, collect a connecting alignment there forming a capital block letter H. And all the rest of the letters are fairly similar construction. And you can imagine if the trees were clear and if they were painted bright white, it would have been quite visible from the air. Another marker is for Clemenceau. This is in Yavapai County, Arizona on the Coconino National Forest. This is also constructed of big block letters, about 15 feet tall, about 230 feet long overall made of sandstone, boulders, and cobbles. And uh, it's pointing towards what is now the Cottonwood Airport, about 18 miles west, northwest. But at the time, in the 30s and 40s, it was called the Clemenceau Airport. Clemenceau is now a neighborhood of Cottonwood, but at the time, it was its own separate mining town. Again, this one not very visible from the air today. Uh, but this is a sketch of what the block letters look like, spelling out Clemenceau with the arrow and approximate distance to what is now at Cottonwood Airport. And this is a picture of what we can see on the ground here. This is the arrow figure. It's pointing towards the camera. So the point of the arrow here, the tip, and then the stem extending towards the rear. Again, not very visible today, but we can imagine that if the brush was cleared, it was painted bright white. Uh, it would have been quite more visible from the air. Another marker is for the main airstrip. Main is a railroad siding just south of Parks, Arizona. Um, and there's no remains of an airfield here today, uh, but these older aeronautical section markers do indicate that there was a main airstrip, an emergency airstrip in the 30s and 40s. Uh, the marker for it is out on Sycamore Point. Uh, this is on the Coconino, or on the in Coconino County, on the Kaibab National Forest. This one actually was pointed out to me by a retired Kaibab archaeologist, Neil Weintraub, who I'm sure some of you know. This one is very deteriorated; hardly anything is visible, even on the ground, much less in the air. But it does form a similar. Uh, so it is of similar construction to the other ones with the big block letters spelling out main and then the arrow. The mileage is somewhat eroded away though at this point. There's also a marker for Phoenix. This one is in the Coconino National Forest, also constructed of big block letters about 15 feet tall by 220 feet long overall. And it's pointing down towards what is now Phoenix Sky Harbor International Airport about 76 miles south, southwest. And this one is notable because it's one of the few that I am aware of, the only one that I'm aware of, that has been actually continually maintained. So it is actually still visible from the air as it would have been originally. This is what we can see on Google Earth. And again, it's PHX, abbreviation for Phoenix, arrow marker, 
75 miles. This one also has uh, some initials off in the corner here. I believe it says PPA, which I think is the Payson Pilots Association. So I assume that they are the folks who are upkeeping uh, these markers on the ground and keeping the, the brush clear and the rocks painted. But this is the best indication kind of of what this would have looked like historically, um, what all these markers would have looked like historically. And finally, we have a marker for Winslow. This, uh, th this marker is notable in that it's on the same landform as Chavez Pass Ruin, which is a uh, ancestral Hopi Northern Sinawa Pueblo complex, quite massive um, on the Coconino National Forest. Um, and this one is actually kind of built into the Pueblo itself, likely constructed of boulders and cobbles robbed from the Pueblo masonry, unfortunately. Uh, and it's pointing up towards Win what is now Winslow Lindbergh Regional Airport in Williams. Uh, it's also constructed of similar features. Uh, it's large block letters, 12 to 15 feet tall and about 140 feet long overall. Here's a, a sketch map overlaid over the aerial. Again, nothing much visible from the sky anymore, uh, but this is what it looks like on the ground when I recorded it. And this is an image of the arrow character, again, pointing towards the camera, corners here, and the stem of it extending away from the camera. The uh, portions of it, back up here, portions of it, including the W, were obliterated during a uh, earlier excavation of the site by a backhoe trench, unfortunately. So those are some air marker sites. What can we make of this? Now, first off, they're not necessarily following any of the significant air routes across the state. So as Dan mentioned, there were various air routes, um, including the contract airmail routes, the cam routes, um, and those had these, um, you know, beacon towers marking uh, air routes across the state and across the country. Uh, these particular markers do not seem to be arranged in any sort of linear fashion aligning with any of these known air routes. So it seems likely that they are not marking routes, but rather that they were placed then for some other purpose, perhaps to guide lost pilots. They're also not particularly prominent or visible from the ground. Uh, suggesting that uh, they were really designed very specifically for air navigation, not for any sort of ground navigation. They are very consistent in their design. Um, they're all built of these big block letters, about 10 to 15 feet tall. Um, they have a very function forward design, very expedient construction. Uh, they're all they all, again, are indicating the direction to a nearby airfield that would have been present in the 1930s and 40s with approximate mileage. And they all had this same basic form, the, the name of the town with the airfield, the arrow, and the mileage, suggesting that they were part of a similar uh, construction endeavor. In terms of di di distribution, here's where they are. This is the location of the actual marker, not the um, not the airfield they're indicating, but the marker themselves. Again, they're not arranged in any particular linear pattern marking a known air route. Um, they are at an average distance of about 28 miles apart, which coincidentally is about double the distance of the stated goal of the uh, air marking program. Remember, they were aiming to make these markers every 15 miles across the country. And this is about double that, suggesting that either uh, there are remaining markers to be found in between them, or that, uh, you know, for expedience sake, they perhaps doubled the distance uh, to get be better coverage across these rural areas. We also know from Blanche Noy's interview back in 1938, that at least at that point in 38, Arizona had 143 markers across the state. That's quite a number. Uh, we would expect, of course, that not all of those have survived, but it would seem likely that at least some have, uh, and that they still intended at this point to, to make more. 
which taken together, you know, these sites meet the functional and locational criteria of the National Air Marking Program, which makes it seem likely to me that they were constructed as part of that endeavor um, under the coordination of Blanche Noyes. Until we find some actual firm documentation, perhaps in the National Archives, detailing which markers were built by the program and where, it's going to be tricky to make a firm connection between them. But I, again, I think based off of the criteria, there's a good chance that they are connected with that program. Uh, they are also all on national forest land, coincidentally. Um, that may either be a function of, uh, of them being an endeavor under the national forest. That's a possibility. Um, or it could simply be that they are preserved because they are on national forest land. Could be one or the other. Now, sites associated with this program are going to be a finite resource, since many of them were intentionally destroyed uh, in during World War II uh, along co coastal areas, or they've deteriorated over time. Again, the preferred uh, construction method was to paint them on rooftops. Uh, and of course, since the 1930s and 40s, many of those rooftops have been repainted over or destroyed, meaning that most of these sites, if they exist at all, are going to be in more rural areas where they were constructed of these more durable materials like stone. And if these sites are indeed part of that program, they're going to be an important link to the history, not, not just the history of aviation in, in the United States, but also the history of women in aviation in the United States. This being the National Air Marking Program, the first US government program conceived and directed and fully staffed by women. Again, this is ongoing research. Um, I, I owe a lot of uh, gratitude to many people who have helped me, me with it. And uh, I am hoping to get something published on this at some point soon, um, but I'm also still collecting information and data. With that, thank you very much for your time. And uh, I will turn it back to our coordinators. Thank you. Okay. Now, I, oh, now that it's, uh, uh, yes, Donna, um, no, I'm, I'm off. I'll have to come back. Oh, okay. Well, I tell you what, I'll, I'll jump in here. Um, I'm not seeing, let's see, we've got a will, really interesting, and thank you in the chat. It, are there any other questions that people have, um, you can either put them in the chat or raise your hand. And um, while people, go ahead, Donna. I was going to say, one person has asked, uh, is there an inventory of the air markings in their actual locations? Oh, there it is. Hi, Jen. Thanks for that question. Um, not to my knowledge. I assume that there is one somewhere. Um, again, the Air marking program reported via their own uh, documentation that there were 13,000 of them by the time uh, they started de destroying them in 1942. Um, so at one point, they knew at least about how many they had. That makes me assume that they did have a more organized list of where they were and what they were. Um, my guess is that that would be in the National Archives in Washington. And as of right now, or as of a year ago, I should say the last time I checked, uh, those records were not d digitized. Um, they did have on file that there were something like four linear feet of records related to the National Air Marking Program. And so maybe the next time I'm in DC, I'll uh, try to take a closer look. That sounds good. One, my, my question is, I'm fascinated that it was women who decided. And, you know, if we go through that old age thing, Women will ask directions, men won't. So that they were establishing that for the majority of male pilots. I don't know. Is there any real background in why it initiated, you know, through women pilots? Well, there's, I've read up a little bit on the, on that early history of women in aviation. And, you know, one of the, one of the themes that I keep coming across is, Something uh, I think Dan kind of hinted at earlier, which is that those early days of aviation were very focused on 
kind of trick flying and circus flying and uh, you know, you had your World War I uh, pilots who were kind of had this almost uh, chival, chivalry type persona. And so early aviation really had this very stunt kind of machismo attitude towards it. And so what we had then, while that was kind of the public per perception of it, um, many flying interests, business, et cetera, were very invested in making aviation seem more safer than for the consuming public. If it was going to grow beyond stunt flying and circus flying, uh, it had to be seen as a more uh, kind of safe territory, safe world. And so that's one, one view is that that might be why uh, there was kind of a window here where women flyers could, could start to get involved with that um, because they kind of helped uh, domesticate the the practice and so that's one idea is that uh, is that by having a more female focused administration of ru running it there that uh, that it made the whole thing more accessible uh, but yeah uh, there was that quote I read from uh, Helen McCloskey let me see if I can bring that up While you're looking for that, um, Katie Brzezina, who is an archaeologist from the Mount Taylor Ranger District, says they have a record of the air markings they've located so far as part of their internal records. And she says, if there's an ongoing effort to consolidate that data, I'd be happy to compile what we have. So, you might Interesting. Have... And which forest was that? Um, she's with the Mount Taylor Ranger. That's yeah, Cibola. Ah, see, 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 see what? Nice. I'll make a note of that. Oh, uh, yeah. The the quote from Helen McCloskey was um was that she uh, expected that why do they choose girls to do this work? Because there are still few enough women pilots in the country. They think we could do a better job of selling the interests of, of private flying. So that's it. You know, it's just do. really, really um, a fascinating um, aspect. And we have another person that just says, um, to really thank you uh, all, she says, as a mid-century aged Arizona native, I always enjoy learning more about my beloved Southwestern states and well done. That, so that was just a, a comment. Now, okay, uh, now, here's can another- Can I back up to uh, Katie's? Uh, Donna, can I back up to Katie's? Jack, are you in, interested in that info that she has? Yes, if you could put, put us in touch, I'd be much much appreciated. I was going to say, Katie, go ahead and reach out to me, and I'll I'll get you guys connected. All right. Um, now the other thing is, you have to know who this one is from. It's Vic Linoff, who has somewhat of a comedian himself. He says perhaps the local markers weren't intended for cross country navigation but were direction markers for local communities. Air access into more remote mining and ranching to uh, towns might have been better facilitated as a thought. Yes, that's a, definitely another possibility is that, uh, yeah, that, that these markers were not associated with the national air marking program at all, but were, were rather a much more local Arizona-based uh, initiative, so. Well, one of the other things and I don't know whether you can answer it or someone else, is those beacon markers that were really for the national cross, are any of those still, do they exist? Yeah, there's one uh, outside of Grants, New Mexico, which is now operated as a aviation museum. I believe it's been relocated. It was on Oso Ridge outside of Grants, and I think that it's now located along the, the interstate nearby grants. There's a website out there and I think a Google search would pull it up. Um, okay. And then otherwise, uh, it, with the discussion of inventory, there, there was an inventory of the lighted beacons along cam route number 34. And those were captured in the air commerce bulletins of the 1930s. And they would list out every single uh, location uh, specific down to towns. Uh, where the the beacon stations were located, there is another one that's probably in ruins now, outside of Grants, where a crash occurred, 
uh, in the 1930s, and then they relocated to Oso Ridge. Short answer is yes, there are uh, 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 at least ruins of these uh, lighted beacon stations still extant. Um, the concrete arrows are still extant, a number of concrete arrows, um, but a lot of the uh, actual towers have been removed over time. Thank you. Um, yeah, and Katie says what you're talking about, that's her district. The museum is in the Grand Mil Milan airfield now. I had a question, um, and actually you guys may have kind of um, touched on it, but I know there have been just cement uh, arrows created. And I was trying to figure out, Jack, um, or was the program that you're talking about, was that primarily using rocks or did they actually create cement ones? And if they didn't, were those cement ones more likely associated with a national route? The concrete, the poured concrete arrows were associated with the contract airmail routes. Um, okay. I believe I read somewhere though that that the one that crosses Arizona, CAM 34, uh, Dan, I believe that was one of the only routes that did not incorporate the concrete arrows. I think that the concrete arrows were incorporated in many of the other uh, CAM routes, but not necessarily 34 across Arizona. Yeah, it said uh, it, they didn't have a concrete arrow at every single uh, beacon station, but there were a couple. It just wasn't 100%. Yeah. Use of concrete arrows, such as other cam routes, utilized. Yeah, but those uh those those concrete arrow, arrows were specifically for the cam routes, uh, because the arrows were indicating the direction of the route. So not necessarily a nearby airport or anything, but more the direction of the route. Um, and so, yeah. so the the national air marking program, those air markers were different in that they weren't marking a specific route. They were rather evenly di distributed every 15 miles or so, simply indicating a nearby airport for potentially lost pilots. So those those national air marking program markers did not usually use poured concrete to my knowledge. They were they tried to paint them on roofs or if that wasn't available. They constructed them out of uh, boulders or rocks or perhaps even wood um, in more rural areas. We have another question kind of related to that. What altitude would a plane have to fly to see the next beacon 15 miles away? I'll okay. have to do some math on that one. Um, <laughs> I'm not positive, actually. Uh, I should I should double check that. But uh, yeah, no, not being a pilot myself, I'm not sure exactly oh, what the altitude would have to be. Also, I mean, these, um, these uh, markers were only about 10 to 15 feet tall, the block letters. Mm -hmm. So that right there, you know, is indicating that this is pr from the earlier days of aviation where people were not flying at a massive, massive elevations um, or altitudes. But what about the, the commercial lines? Would, those are still, would that make a difference? Because that would have been more mass. I'm not sure I understand that question. Well, you know, they're the ones with the markers that you were showing us that were kind of in the rural areas, but the ones with the beacons and stuff, and those were originally every 15 miles. Is that too? Oh, or no, not, not necessarily. The, okay. um, the lighted beacons, which were to mark the, the contract airmail routes, mm -hmm. those were designed to be co-visible. Okay. So from, from one lighted beacon at night, um, you'd be able to see the next lighted beacon down the road. Uh, there's actually a, you've probably read this, Dan, there's a be be beautiful quote, uh, I think in Ruth Reinhold's book, uh, where she talks about seeing the the string of beacons uh, along Cam Route 34, uh, stretching through the Arizona night. Very, very pr 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 pretty quote. <laughs> I I'll see your link there, Dan, for uh, that uh, airmail route blog, I'm aware of that site, it's a great re resource. There, and there are other websites out there, but yeah, that one was was uh, pretty comprehensive. Yep, it's good. Are there any more questions? Not, I have a few announcements, but are there any more questions? Okay, I'm going to share my screen because we've got two events coming up. The oops, I've got, got to get to my share screen. 
The next um, okay. one that uh, webinar that we're having is on Architecture 101. It's the Architecture of Arizona's Working Class Community. The registration for that is not open. It should be open either this afternoon or tomorrow, we hope. And the other thing is that we're having our, oh, come back here. Our book club, we're reading The Water Knife. And if you thought aviation was really interesting, water history and the future of water in the Southwest, this will be on um, Tuesday, December 23rd. That registration is open if anyone wants to share with us, you know, join us. Anyway, and we'll have a lot of things you can, as I mentioned before, this is being recorded and we will send out the link as soon as it is posted on our YouTube page. And I want to thank our three speakers for joining us today. This was an absolutely fascinating thing and interesting. And I do remember seeing that one rock thing with the Phoenix. I think we've all, well, most of us probably have seen that. And you're always wondering, what is that? Now I know um, about that program. And I can't think of anything else. Margaret, do you have anything? No, no, no. I, just, I just mirror your thanks very much and uh, to be able to present it out to a wider audience because you guys have done some amazing stuff. And thank you for being willing to share that. Well, we can all sign off and thank you. Hope you have a rest of the good day.